Welcome to Spirit of Truth Church for this sermon on Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. And now join me for a word of prayer. Lord, we praise your name. God, we thank you for your redemption. Lord, we thank you for the provision you have made for us in salvation. God, we understand that your death on the cross was the most important thing that has ever happened in human history. God, may we celebrate it, may we proclaim it to the nations. Lord, we praise your name and we thank you, God, in the midst of difficulties and in the midst of times of joy. Lord, we also pray for the persecuted church in this time. And we also pray for Israel. In your name we pray. Amen. And now, let's move to the reading of the scripture. Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? We are able, they said to him. He told them, You will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and my left is not mine to give. Instead, it belongs to those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them, and the men of high positions exercise power over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now I'd like to argue that the main idea of these verses is as follows. In these verses, Jesus again reminds the disciples that positions of authority are not things to be concerned about. Rather, they should set themselves to the mindset of a servant in preparation for their kingdom roles. Now I'd like to move on to the exegetical portion of the sermon. So in verses 20 and 21, we notice that this minor conversation is happening right on the heels of Jesus giving his disciples the private message about his death and resurrection. And then James, John, and their mother come to ask about places in the kingdom, which is completely ignoring the implications of what Jesus had recently said. And so the question was, well, if Jesus was going to declare, if he'd be willing to declare that her two sons would receive the highest positions in the coming kingdom. And it's entirely possible that the rest of the disciples were already seeing Peter in this position, and so people were jockeying for this sort of first and second positions. And what's interesting, though, is there is an aspect of faith present here. The mother clearly believes that even in spite of the current situation, there's going to be a future kingdom. But the request itself is fundamentally selfish. It is nothing other than a power grab. They were, at this juncture, only concerned for their own glory. Now, in verse 22, we see that Jesus actually shows a large degree of patience and restraint. Uh, it, it's not easy to see if the response would be intended as a rebuke. In fact, it's not necessarily intended to be that way. But first, he's going to show the magnitude of the request. He's going to tell them that they literally do not even comprehend what they're actually asking for. They have no clue what they're actually asking for. They're viewing this from an earthly perspective. And it's ignorance that seeks leadership, power, and glory. Because to reign with Jesus, you have to suffer with him. So then Jesus asked them, are they able to drink the cup he's about to drink? And the cup is essentially a symbol of taking what's served to you in life. And for Jesus, this is going to be a humiliating and painful suffering and death at the hands of his enemies. It's going to be the flogging, the crucifixion, the mockery, everything else. And I think you could only read this in a flippant way. They say, well, yes, of course. But that's not reflecting courage. They're not thinking about what Jesus is actually going to go through. They just don't even understand the horror of what's to come. And that's why when the time comes to really stand with Jesus, potentially even being crucified with him, theoretically, if they were to defend him, they all flee. So clearly they are not ready. And so Jesus is going to make two points in his response. And the first one is interesting because this has pretty substantial ramifications for James and John, which is that they would indeed drink his cup. 
In other words, they're going to go to some form of scorn, mockery, probably beatings, humiliation, and then ultimately death. Second, he's going to tell them that even though they're going to drink his cup, the appointing of the ranking in the kingdom, the appointment of these positions in the kingdom and these thrones is not his prerogative. He says it's the Father's will that will reward those who serve his servant, the Messiah. Quote, these places of honor have been prepared, indicating they were previously made ready for the ones the Father chose, end quote. So in other words, what we've got here is God the Father is showing his Trinitarian role, which is that he's the one designating, he's the one doing all of these things from an administrative perspective. Jesus is going to be the one who's executing. And so now in verse 24, we see that the natural response for the remaining disciples was jealousy and anger. The 10 verse of the 2 is going to emphasize a division in the disciples. There's jealous attitudes, envious attitudes. Because none of these guys have taken to heart the lesson that to be the greatest in the kingdom required humility, trust, servanthood, and essentially becoming the least. Now in verses 25 through 28, we see that knowing the earlier lesson was missed, Jesus is now going to use a metaphor from Roman culture, and he's going to talk about these rulers, these Gentile rulers that flaunt their positions, they demand obedience, they're overbearing, they're controlling, all of this stuff. And the rulers of the Gentiles referred to the Romans and their levels of government. They had a very complex system of authority, and the highest positions were determined by wealth and birth. So the Romans took from, dem demanded from, and abused their subjects regularly. And the rulers held envious positions and acquired the most and best material possessions of anyone around. In other words, they had all the stuff. They had the big homes and the big stuff. Everyone else was forced to give them honor and obedience. And Jesus flat out says that that style of leadership is not the model for his servants. That the greatest in the kingdom would be the one who gave and served others. And so Jesus is essentially arguing that secular and spiritual leadership are antithetical to each other. And this rests in the attitude of the servant. And this is a shock to the disciples. They have been looking at this form of government saying that powerful men are esteemed and flattered and waited on. And that's what they want. They want a chance to be at the table. But whoever wishes to be first among you should be your slave. In other words, servanthood is going to result in a reward of priority in the kingdom. And this standard of servanthood is demonstrated by Jesus himself. He says, just as, and this attests to the degree of becoming a slave of the others. Jesus came to freely give, freely heal, freely teach, and he gave his whole life. And it's interesting, it doesn't use the word bios. Uh, which would be more of the physical life. He used the term suke or soul. He gave his very life essence or his very soul. He gave his life, the suke, as a ransom, buying the freedom for the slaves. And Jesus served to the point of dying for others. And so essentially you have here Jesus setting up a very different model of leadership and very different model of servanthood from anything else the disciples had ever seen. And now let's move to the expository portion of the sermon. So the first theme I want to bring out is this concept of power, authority, and the kingdom. And there's a consistent theme about power, authority, and the kingdom in Scripture. And its context is unlike anything we see here on this earth. So on earth, we see that power is being able to actualize your will. Doing what you want to do and having the power to accomplish it. We often see it's accompanied by a sinful desire for an unrestrained actualization. In other words, it's doing whatever you want to do, whatever your evil heart desires. It's accompanied by a sinful desire to exercise power to dominate others, as Jesus said in the sermon, in the, in the verse, right? It's accompanied by a sinful desire to exercise power to dominate others, as we see from Jesus' statements in these verses. There's a sinful desire to control others by the use of power. There's a sinful desire to acquire power for the material benefit and gain, and a desire to acquire power to protect oneself. So virtually none of these things are going to accompany power in the kingdom. And we'll see that in a little bit. But everything people desire power for here on earth, none of it applies in the Messianic kingdom. And so it's very easy to see why the disciples, thinking that this was going to be just like another earthly kingdom, got confused and didn't understand the point that how power and authority are even going to be handled and used is fundamentally different when sin's been dealt with and when Jesus reigns. So what about authority in, on earth? This is the authorization to exercise the use of power. Again, it's going to be accompanied by a sinful desire to control other people, to actualize one's personal view of reality, 
A desire to be above the law or the rules is usually accompanied with this, and a desire and drive to be on the top or be the best. Again, the only one of these that's going to be present is an authorization to exercise the use of power, but the rest of it's going to be gone. The rest of it will not be part of God's kingdom. So what do these things look like in the kingdom? Well, power will only ever be used in accordance with the will of God and the law of God. It will only ever be used in cases where justice is being infringed upon. It's only going to be used sparingly. It will never be used to control or dominate others. And what about authority? Well, it will only be exercised to effectuate God's vision of the kingdom. It's never going to be associated with a privileged or higher class of people. It's not going to be something to be envied. It's not going to be used to effectuate one's own will. It'll be somewhat inconsequential to people who are saved. I mean, essentially, it's going to have to be like having to deal with unruly people. In other words, it'll be the, the unsaved Gentiles that are really going to have these conflicts with authority, but for the most part, believers aren't. And there's going to be some sort of management with God's people, but given that individual stewardship is the intended final form of government, it seems highly unlikely that their role is going to be heavily influential in the way that government is now. And so what then do we say about these things? Well, the battle is never to be won in a political system. The battle is to be won in the individual heart and mind who is now dedicated to loving and serving God. And the highest form of government being self-government, that should be the focus here on earth, not the acquisition of power and authority. Power and authority are an illusion. There's something that, yes, does exist, yes, you can do it, but ultimately it's inconsequential when compared to God's sovereignty and the reality of the coming messianic kingdom. Now, the second thing we can gather from these verses is the Father's role. And so from the text, we see that it's not the Son's right to give positions in the kingdom to people. It's the Father's right to give these positions. And the Father also prepares these positions. In other words, the Father's setting up the messianic kingdom. He's preparing it. He's designating how it will be conducted and who will be in what positions. And so there's some interesting thoughts on the Trinity we can glean from this. That it's God who does all these things, yes, but when God creates the Messianic Kingdom, the Father designs it. He's literally setting up the positions and, and granting to different people the positions they'll have. The Son executes it. He's going to be the one physically reigning from the throne. And the Spirit effectuates it. In other words, how are people brought into the Kingdom? The Spirit's application of salvation, being born again, and then adopted into God's family. So you actually see the whole Trinity at work here. And so we interact with members and persons of the Trinity directly, which is why Jesus makes the comment that it's not up to him to give these positions, yet all three still remain God. Because they're interacting with the Son. It wasn't the Son's prerogative to issue the positions. It was the Father's prerogative. Yet we can say that it is God who chooses to instantiate the Messianic Kingdom. Now, what about leadership in church? Well, what is the character of this leadership? Well, it's best characterized as servant leadership, with the backbone of individual self-government. In other words, the leadership in the kingdom is a position from which you'll be focused on serving people and serving God. And the best preparation then is self-governance, loving and serving others here on earth, and managing your own household. And a natural leap from this is that we're not here to seek out power and authority, but we're here to manage and steward what God has given us to the best of our ability. Additionally, we see that Jesus talked about the rulers of the Gentiles dominating them. This isn't going to exist in the Messianic kingdom. Ultimately, these positions aren't going to be about exercising power over others or getting them to be in line with your personal vision. It's going to be about serving people. And how crazy will that feel if we actually had political leaders who we actually truly felt like were actually serving us? But we don't. We have many leaders who are serving themselves. And so we have the issues that we have. Now, one these leadership positions are going to be wholly concerned with elevating others and lifting others up. In other words, they're, you're going to, people who hold these positions are going to be the servants of all. Example would be like this. Person A accomplishes something great, but only with the help of person B. The leaders are going to be like person B to a lot of people. They're also going to maintain Christ's law and order. But service is going to be the primary thing that concerns their time. Additionally, there's a sanctification element in service as well that we have to discuss which is putting down the pride that's present in any leadership position that's given. See, it's both, being a servant is both practical in the sense that that's the type of leadership you're going to be exercising, but it's also sanctifying because you're putting to death any sinful pride or things like that that are present. So you actually kind of get preparation both spiritually and in terms of more occupationally. And so now for the Christocentric setting. 
As Christ mentions in the verses, he's giving his life as a ransom for many. And let's take a look at Psalm 49, 5-8 for a little context. Why should I fear in times of trouble? The iniquity of my foes surrounds me. They trust in their wealth and boast of their abundant riches. Yet these cannot redeem a person or pay his ransom to God. Since the price of redeeming him is too costly, one should forever stop trying, so that he may live forever and not see the pit. And now let's take a look at Psalm 49, 15. But God will redeem my life from the power of Sheol, for he will take me. And here we have God redeeming a person for himself. It's interesting because Jesus is going to redeem these people for himself and for the Father. Another piece of divinity here that we're seeing, another divinity proof that we're seeing is God is the one doing the redemption. Therefore, if Jesus is the one doing the redemption of mankind, if he's the only one who can pay that price, then he must therefore be God. Now, in terms of application, I think there's a couple quick points we can make. First, there's the sovereignty of God over our lives. If God is choosing positions and places in the Messianic kingdom, he's choosing everything. I mean, ultimately, God is the one who's, who's setting our path before us that we are to walk. Uh, we owe our work to him. We owe our positions to him. We owe everything to him. He is the one who gives. And he is sovereign over our lives. And yes, we do make decisions, but ultimately, history is unfolding in the way that God would see it unfold. And so we can know that both in our lives as we also see it here in Scripture. In terms of leadership and service, we have to remember that even as God grants us leadership positions, our main and primary focus should be serving other people. This does, to some extent, mean looking out for the ideals that we hold as Christians, the ideals and things we believe in, in Scripture, but it also means that we are very, very concerned with the health, mental, spiritual, and physical well-being of the people that we serve. And finally, our redemption by Jesus the Messiah. He paid for our sins. But there's this interesting way of referring to it the Bible uses, this idea of redemption. And this makes it, in some sense, very personal. Because when someone was redeemed, they were typically being redeemed from slavery of some kind. And you're redeeming them, you're buying them, essentially buying them or buying them back. You see this in Hosea as well. And when someone's buying someone back, in terms of they want to have a relationship with them, it's even more beyond belief. Just like Hosea bought his wife back here, we have God buying his people back. Because he wants to be in relationship with them. And so we see our redemption by Jesus himself through his death on the cross for our sins. And in conclusion, I would like to say this. Praise God that he has redeemed us from the penalty of our sins and brought us into his glorious kingdom. As we go through life on earth, we are to take the position and attitude of a servant, just as Jesus did when he laid down his life for us. And now let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we praise your name for your scripture. We praise your name, God, for every word you've spoken. Lord, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your redemption. We pray for the salvation of others. Lord, please give us opportunities to share your gospel. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Spirit of Truth Church. I hope you have a wonderful day.